This is Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast, and as always, I'm your host, Mark, and I'm joined by photographer Paul Natkin today. You may not know the name, but you'll recognize his images. He tells me about his father's own incredible photographic legacy before we get into his own. Paul reveals the exact moment he knew he wanted to be a photographer and the serendipitous moment that thrust him into live music photography. He discusses how two months in 1984 changed his life, starting with Prince's birthday party. He's worked with Springsteen, The Rolling Stones, Oprah Winfrey, and the 1985 Chicago Bears. Remember the Super Bowl shuffle? There's also his stint as Brian Wilson's road manager. Paul's honest about the decision that cost him 90% of his business and the new rules to shooting live shows. He has a new book with over 150 of his best images from ABBA to ZZ Top. Look for it on Amazon. You can check out his website at natkin.net and give us a follow at Performance Annex on social media. Show us some support with coffee at ko-fi.com slash performance anxiety or with merch at performanceanx.threadless.com. Now get ready for a real behind-the-scenes discussion with photographer Paul Natkin on Performance Anxiety on the Pantheon Podcast Network. Okay, you want me to start now? Okay, uh, this is Paul Natkin. Um, I'm a photographer based in Chicago. I've got a book coming out uh, called A Moment of Truth, which is a collection of my f- photographs. I'm on performance anxiety right now with Mark. I always feel weird about doing stuff like that, but it's, you know... I feel like I feel like I'm under pressure to make sure it's right. Well, thank you for joining me. This is quite the honor. I really do appreciate your time. Uh, it's my honor. My honor. Yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen my photographs yet, so we don't know. Oh, so well, maybe well, maybe I'll see them someday. Oh, hopefully I can text you some. Cool. <laughs> so, you are mostly known for your music photography, but. I kind of want to f- f- find out how you got started in photography in the be- from the very beginning. Your father, Robert, was a photographer. Was that how you, you got into photography? Was it through him? Well, sort of. He was he was a photographer before I was born. Okay. He got out. He was a photographer in World War II, and he got out wow. of the army. And uh, he and a friend from the from the army were riding on a boat back to the United States from North Africa. And they decided to start a magazine when they got to Chicago. Oh, wow. And the magazine was called Ebony Magazine. <laughs> his, his, my father's friend was John Johnson from wow. Johnson Publishing. And they started a magazine. My father was the first photographer for Ebony Magazine. Oh, my God. For about two years until he figured out that they figured out that they couldn't be a legitimate black magazine with a little short Jewish guy as <laughs> as their photographer. <laughs> so they agreed to uh, part ways. Wow. And uh, he hooked on with an agency called Black Star, which was a big agency in New York that sent photographers all over the place for magazines like Life and Look and Saturday Evening Post. Wow. He did assignments for all those magazines. He was the official photographer of the Chicago Housing Authority. Oh, wow. And uh, and then I was born. And my mother kind of intimated to him that he should quit photography. <laughs> yeah. Because he was traveling all the time. Uh you can't be a father if you're traveling all the time. Yep. So he quit and became a building contractor. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, all the time I was growing up, I was, you know, he had power tools in the basement and he was doing, you know, building houses. Wow. And uh, when I was in college, uh, I was about 19 and I was still living at home with my parents and he kind of went bankrupt in the building business. Not officially bankrupt, but people weren't building houses because it was like 1972, 73. It was the recession, the Vietnam War, all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, so he decided that since he wasn't making money, he might as well not be making money taking pictures. <laughs> so he got out all his old equipment from 20 years earlier and cleaned it all up and started walking around the streets of Chicago taking pictures. Oh, wow. And I still, at that point, could have cared less. 
Okay. You know, I, I, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And then one day he called a friend of his who was the team photo- the team publicist for the Chicago Bulls basketball team. Okay. And they were brand new. They had just started out. Nobody cared about them. Right. Uh, and uh, he called his friend Ben and he said, hey, you know, do you have any work? And Ben Bentley said, well, you know, we can't pay you, but if you come to the games and take pictures, if we like them, we'll buy them from you. Okay. So he uh, he went to a game, took some pictures, came home, and he told me this crazy story. Uh, the story had four parts. Okay. You can tell I've told this story before. Yeah. <laughs> but it, but it's, it's kind of relevant. Uh, part number one, free parking right next to the building. Oh, nice. Part, num- part number two, get into the game for free. Even better. Part number three, free hot meal in the press box. Oh, nice. And part number four, best seats in the house. And at that moment, I decided to become a photographer. Yeah. <laughs> and the first time I ever held a camera in my hand, I was sitting, I was standing courtside at a Bulls game. Oh, Wow. Uh, and he showed me like this is what you look through this is the button you push this is how you advance the film oh my and gosh. uh and there i was you know taking pictures for the first time in my life wow and uh it was kind of cool that is amazing so y- did you uh, work with him a lot after that to you know learn well, the ropes he, you know we never made any money doing it we just you kind of did it for fun. They would buy some prints every once in a while, but yeah. you know, nobody really cared about photography in those days. You know, nobody really paid much attention to it. Ah. So, uh, so we just shot because it was kind of cool to do. And he got tired of it quickly and oh, he, really? he just stopped going. And I still had a card in my wallet that got me into all the games for free. <laughs> so I kept on going. <laughs> and then I, um, started going to other sporting events in Chicago. I met other photographers and they said, Hey, you know, we're uh, a couple of us are going to a tennis match tomorrow. Do you want to come with? We'll get you a pass. And all of a sudden I'm shooting, you know, like famous tennis players. Oh man. So one day I was at up at Northwestern university, which is in the suburb of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was shooting a tennis match, outdoor tennis match, and it was over at about maybe seven o'clock in the evening. Okay. And because there were no lights out there, so it was over when it got dark. Oh, okay. And uh, so I went back to my car, which is parked a couple blocks away, put my stuff in the trunk, and got in and started the engine, ready to. You're probably wondering where this is going, (laughs) but this is the most important part of the whole story. Okay, all right. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Without a healthy mind, being truly happy and at peace is hard. The good news is, therapy works. But what is therapy exactly? It's whatever you want it to be. Maybe you're not feeling motivated right now and would like some tools to help. Or maybe you're feeling insecure in relationships or at work. Not dealing well with the stress. Whatever you need, it's time to stop being ashamed of normal human struggles and start feeling better because you deserve to be happy. And now you don't have to worry about finding an in-person therapist near you to help. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Try doing that in person. So join the millions of people who are seeing what online therapy is really about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And a special offer to Performance Anxiety listeners, you can get 10% off your first month of professional therapy at betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. That's betterhelp.com slash performance anxiety. Thanks again to BetterHelp for sponsoring this podcast. Hey guys, I've got some great news. 
Performance Anxiety and Pantheon podcasts are giving away an exclusive VIP experience to see Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets. So head to pantheonpodcast.com slash Nick Mason to enter. Find the link in the show description or head over to our Twitter, Facebook, at, or Nick Mason's Facebook page for the link to enter to win. Head over to pantheonpodcast.com backslash Nick Mason to enter. Find the link in the show description or head over to our Twitter, Facebook, or Nick Mason's Facebook page for the link to enter to win front row seat upgrades, a very special commemorative guitar pick shaped necklace carved down from a drum cymbal played by Nick Mason himself. You also get a selection of curated exclusive VIP merchandise, including a VIP laminate and lanyard, crowd free shopping at a dedicated merchandise stand before the show, and on site perks such as priority check in, VIP express lane into the venue for ease of entry and a dedicated customer service line. Nick will be playing in my area at the Lincoln Theater in D.C. on September 27th. And I'd love to meet up with a D.C. winner at the show. So enter now at pantheonpodcast.com backslash Nick Mason. Winners will be notified via email one week prior to the event. So enter now. Started the engine and the radio was on. And there was a commercial on the radio for a concert that was happening that night. Okay. And... This concert, I couldn't make this up if I tried. <laughs> There's no way that this story could be any more perfect. Okay. The concert was taking place approximately 10 feet away from where I was sitting at that <laughs> moment. Oh, my God. I was parked in the parking lot of the venue that the concert was happening. <laughs> and it was a woman guitar player that I just barely heard of. She was just starting out. Her name was Bonnie Ray. Oh, wow. Such losers, people don't think I haven't tried to find a man to take me home instead of taking me for a ride. Oh, babe, I know you can. Believe me when I tell you. sitting there in the car and I've always been a music fan and I'm thinking to myself you know what I've been able to BS my way into almost any sporting event in Chicago <laughs> maybe I can figure out a way to how to get into this con figure out a way to get into this concert so I shut off the engine got out put the key, you know the keys in the trunk took my camera stuff out and uh, shut the trunk and walked up to the backstage door and I made I made up a, a great lie <laughs> about how I was working for this new magazine that had just started out called Rolling Stone Magazine. Okay. And uh, which wasn't really that new at the time, but it was fairly new. And, uh, and, I, and I was supposed to have a pass waiting for me, which of course was a big lie and there was no pass waiting for me. <laughs> so I walked up to the backstage door and I opened the door and I walked in, there was a guard sitting there. And, uh, and he, uh, he looked at me and he saw my camera gear and he, before I could tell him my big lie, he said, oh, you're with the press. Go on in and do anything you want. Just don't get on stage. Oh, wow. And that was, uh. that changed my whole life, that moment. Oh, man, that is amazing. And that was the, you know, that was the beginning of my career. That is incredible. I took pictures of Bonnie Raitt, which were, looking back at them now, were really terrible. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> but, you know, I got the bug. I got hooked. Yeah. I actually almost shot Bonnie Raitt last weekend, or last week, and uh, but they did not, declined every press pass. Well, because Bonnie's getting a little bit weird about the way she looks. Ah. Uh, yeah. She doesn't. I mean, I've, I'm, I've been, been great friends with her for years. Yeah. You know, not because of that first day, but I met her a short time after that and been friends ever since. And she always says the same thing to me. She says, boy, I'm really glad you're here. Don't take any pictures of me tonight. I look terrible. Oh, no. <laughs> and I just I just stopped going. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, why pay for parking? You know, 
I've seen her play enough times. I, I don't I don't have to go and listen to her play. Yeah. I want to take pictures. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, she doesn't she doesn't like having herself photographed. Ah, uh, okay. So that makes a little more sense than why because it is her and Lucinda Williams and it was a completely declined all press. Yeah, Lucinda Williams hates to have herself photographed too. Well, that was a double whammy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you basically learned on the job then. You didn't really have any formal training. Oh, I I had no training whatsoever. Wow. I, my, you know, I would go home and my father had a dark room in the basement and I developed a film. And he would wander in every once in a while when I was making prints and say, you know, you should have done this. You should have cropped it a little differently. But mostly, you know, he just left me alone and I kind of learned. I made a print. If it looked good, it was great. If it didn't look good, I tried to do better next time. Going back to the sports, you've done some amazing stuff, but I think one of the coolest things I saw in your uh, on your website was the series that you shot for the 85 Bears Super Bowl Shuffle. Yeah, well, that's not really sports photography. No, it's not. That was kind of music photography. I didn't think of it like that. That's true. Uh, you know, it was a it was a music video basically, That's true. and you know, like it had nothing to do with with me being a sports photographer. It had me. It had to do with me knowing the the engineer and producer of the song. Oh wow! Okay, who called me up one day out of the blue and said, "Hey, you know, we're at this club tomorrow all day, and we're shooting this wacky video for the song. Why don't you just come on by and hang out with us?" And I, I didn't shoot it for any purpose. I just did it because it was the wackiest thing to do in Chicago that day. <laughs> and I was the only one there with a the camera. Oh, of course. Well, you prepared. Well, you know, it, it was it was a lot of fun. I never thought that anybody would ever want the pictures. Oh. And wow. I got to tell you, those are some of my biggest selling pictures of all time. I bet, man. That's uh, every January. Yeah. <laughs> around the Super Bowl. All of a sudden, I start seeing them on my sales report. That's right. <laughs> it's, it was so unique at the time. It's still unique. I don't know anything else that's, that's similar to that. It was so great. It was, uh, it was quite a cultural moment. It was, a, it was a bunch of guys bragging about how great they were. Yeah, exactly. Before they were really all that great. I mean, they were great. They, at that point, they had only lost one game that season. Ironically, the night before. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, you're not supposed to brag until you've actually done it. That's true. That is true. So, you know, it, it would have made more sense for them to do it after the Super Bowl. Yeah. But I, I can see I can see Jim McMahon not wanting to wait. Well, I, you know... <laughs> Actually, not to burst your bubble or anything, he didn't even want to do it. Oh, really? He didn't even. He and Walter Payton didn't even show up. I saw that. I thought maybe there was some other kind of conflict. But no, wow. no, they they didn't even show up, and they shot the whole video. And then the next day, we all went out to training camp. Okay. And they set up a white a white background, and they did. You know, they basically put them into the video. Oh wow! So, yeah, yeah. It was a real, it, it was a real bizarre situation. Did there you, were a lot of people that were, you know, not happy about doing it the day after their only loss of the season? Oh yeah. You know they had imagine. to fly. They had to fly the red eye back from Miami oh. uh, after they lost to the Dolphins, oh. and uh, and then they had to go to the, this club and shoot this video, which you know. Uh, more than half the people in the video were people that nobody's ever even heard of. Yeah. <laughs> there weren't a whole lot of starters. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I never realized that. They're like the second and third string guys. Oh, man. Oh, that's hilarious. I never I never realized that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the fridge was in it and, you know. We there, had to be. There, were, there was some Mike Singletary and Peyton and McMahon, but, you know, like. A lot of guys that were starters thought it was a really lame idea and didn't didn't want to have anything to do with it. Oh man! <laughs> did you? But it was a, it was a fun time. Did you ever go back and and study any other photographers? Do you have any other influences? Because I imagine with, with I studied photography for a few years up in Rochester and. 
So one of the things they have you do is go and study some old photographers like Henri Cartier-Bresson, Ouija. Did you ever go back and, and look at some of those guys and, and study any of that? Well, influence? I, I can't say I can't say I ever studied anybody for influence, but I always admired Cartier-Bresson mm-hmm. for the idea of the decisive moment. Yeah. And I still to this day, uh, I, I shot a blues festival on Saturday. Okay. This last Saturday. And there are four bands. They, it, it was like nine hours of music. Oh, wow. And in the whole day, I shot maybe 200 pictures altogether. Oh, man. And because I wait for things to happen. I don't just shoot because somebody's moving around. I wait for them to do something interesting. Okay. And I was riding home with a couple other photographers, and one guy said that he shot 2,000 photos that day. Whoa. And, you know, like... I, I'm not. I'm not like knocking him. I mean, that's his style. It's the way he does it. But he basically shoots a movie, and then he looks for a still photo that's going to look good. Right. And that you know, Cartier Bresson would be rolling over in his grave if yes, he heard that. That's for sure. <laughs> so I've always admired him. And music-wise, there's a guy named Jim Marshall. Yes. Who is my all-time idol? Oh yeah. And I, I base, I actually got, I met him a couple times, and we got to be friends. We talked on the phone a lot. Oh, that's and awesome! And he, he gave me a lot of business advice. I guess you'd want. I, I, I'm not saying you know he didn't teach me accounting or anything like that, but he, um, I don't know how, how much you know how much you shoot, but back in the old days, there was never this rule that you can only shoot the first three songs. Mm-hmm. Right. You basically just shot whatever you wanted. Ah, I missed that uh, era. And one day in the mid nineties, Marshall was in town and he and I went out to lunch and he got pretty wasted uh, (laughs) at lunch. And, uh, and at one point he said to me, Hey, do you do that? Only shooting three songs and leaving deal that they make people do. And I tried to explain to him, if you don't do that, you don't shoot. Right. And his response, I got to ask you a question first. Is yeah. it okay to swear? Absolutely. His response was, he yelled across the table at me, you're a fucking moron. <laughs> oh, man. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> and he said, when you allow them to dictate where you shoot from or how long you could shoot, they're not your pictures anymore you're basically just copying what they put in front of you. And I went home that day and up to that point, I would, every Monday morning I get on the phone, I start calling publicists and saying, Hey, your band is coming to town. I want to shoot them this week. Uh, leave a photo pass for me, set up a photo shoot. Right. And I decided that day that Monday morning, I was going to call everybody and I was going to ask for photo pass and then say, and by the way, I really don't want to just shoot three songs. I want to shoot the whole show. Right. And it's kind of a deal breaker. If you don't let me do that, I'm not going to go. Wow. And I was selling pictures to a lot of magazines in those days. Okay. And, and I started doing that the following Monday morning. And over the course of the next month, I lost 90% of my business. Wow. And it never came back. Jeez. And, and so, but I look at it, you know, I could, I could sit here and say, Marshall ruined my life by doing that. But instead, the way I look at it is it was the greatest thing anybody could have ever told me. Really? Because rather than shooting really mediocre pictures of a whole bunch of bands, Mm -hmm. I was now shooting really great pictures of a few bands. Okay. Okay. And those are pictures that my name is going to be next to. So, you know, that's, so it was a good thing, but I hardly shoot at, I hardly shoot at all anymore. But even before the pandemic, I was hardly shooting at all because to ask somebody to allow you to shoot the whole show is like asking them, like asking to punch them in the face. Yeah. It, it seems that way, doesn't it? I, mean, I just, I had a 45 minute discussion on Saturday with the publicist at this blues fest to get him to agree to allow 
not just me, but all the photographers there to shoot the whole show, even though the headliner was Buddy Guy, who's a close friend of mine, yeah, yeah, who had already told them that he wanted all the photographers to shoot the whole show. And the uh, two of the other three bands were friends of mine. And I had already called them the night before, and they had sent me emails saying, please allow all the photographers to shoot the whole show. Okay. And it still took 45 minutes to end up with a giant meeting backstage. Oh, to get them to agree that, like, okay, we'll let everybody shoot the whole show of all the bands. I hate that rule. That's just it, it. Well, that's just one rule. That's one of the many rules that has come about because bands want to control their image. And I'm putting quote marks around control. Yeah. The next rule after the first three songs rule was all the older artists started figuring out that they look kind of old in the pictures. Yeah. So how do you how do you get around that? You make everybody shoot from the soundboard. Oh. Which is impossible. That yeah. I mean, it, you might as well you might as well just stay home and shoot from your living room. That's you know, oh. you can't get anything. And then the next rule, my whole business is based on me going out and taking the pictures and licensing them to as many publications as I could license them to. Right. And I don't know if you've uh, if you've been if you've gotten any contracts from any bands to sign. No. Well, about 12, 15 years ago, bands after they in- implemented this shoot from the soundboard rule, the next rule was you get a contract that states that I and then a blank, so you write your name in, are photographing blank the band whatever the band is tonight for blank publication oh wow that is the only place that these photos can go that's wild after you send pictures after you send pictures to that publication you have to turn everything over to the band and we own the copyright to all your photographs oh my gosh and then the contract goes goes on and says, once we own the copyright to your photographs, we can use them. And I'm going to quote, they all use the same verbiage in this contract. Okay. Somebody got a hold of it and sent it to managers all over, the, all over America. The paragraph that I love in this says, we could use your pictures for the, until the end of time, for any publication invented to this day or invented in the future on earth and beyond on earth and beyond. <laughs> now, do you know why they say on earth and beyond? I can't even imagine. The internet is up in the sky. Oh my gosh. So basically first they tell you that you can't make any money off the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Then they tell you that you can't even take good pictures. Right. And then they want to own them all. Yeah. <laughs> and be able to use them for free. That, uh... And that contract comes up maybe every third band that comes through town. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. Hey, guys, I want to talk to you about socks for a second. Why not? It's a music podcast. But I tried a pair of socks from Boldfoot and loved them. I've only worn them once because my kids have stolen them. So in my household, that's the best endorsement I can give. And I guess it's fitting because the design I chose was Jailbait. Wait, Jailbird. The design I chose was Jailbird. I might keep that in. The socks are 100% American made and 5% of all proceeds go to veteran charities. It makes sense, seeing that Boldfoot is a family and veteran-owned company. They have a huge variety of styles. So check out boldfoot.com and buy some of the best socks you've ever slapped on your feet. And help veterans while you're at it. That's boldfoot.com. I haven't dealt with that yet, but I I go through a little different way. I shoot for a a local blog in in D.C. And what happens, I, I get the three song rule all the time, but... I try to break that rule as much as possible. 
Right. So that's the only rule that I've been told of. As far as the blog is concerned, they they're like they say you know you send us send us your pictures and they're still your pictures. You do whatever you want with them after that. So right. I haven't I haven't had the misfortune of dealing with I guess maybe probably maybe not a band big enough to uh, to have that kind of contract right now. Yeah, it's uh you'll you'll notice it. Oh, you'll, sure. you'll you'll start noticing it if you haven't noticed it yet. Uh, uh, it's going to happen. That's awful. Uh, and it, so well, that's you know that's the state of the business at this point. So there's really no reason to ever leave the house to take pictures anymore. For example, if if I were to shoot from the soundboard, I have a 300 millimeter lens, but that's not long enough. Right. So what I would have to do is I'd have to rent a 400, let's say, or a 600, which costs about a hundred dollars right. to rent for a. I could even find one in Chicago somewhere. So it's going to cost me a hundred dollars. More than likely, the publication I'm working for will probably pay me about twenty dollars. Right. Now, if I can't sell it to any other publications. And if, and the other thing they tell you is you can't syndicate it. So I can't send anything to Getty. Oh, man. Which is my main source of income. So because God forbid that like 10 publications might want my picture. Of oh, the yeah. Band. So they basically put so many roadblocks in front of me that I don't even there's no reason to do it, especially because I don't know what it's like in your neck of the woods, but. Parking in Chicago now averages fifty dollars for D- a couple of hours. Yeah, DC DC is close. I can probably do forty on a weeknight for a, a, a long enough to get into the show and then get out. Right. So if I'm paying fifty dollars to park, number one, I can't make. I can't even make that back. Right. <laughs> Uh, much the less, even if I don't rent a lens, even yeah. if the 300 is going to be good enough and I carry it along. Yeah. But so what, what reason would there be for me to actually go out and shoot, you know, other than the fact that I love music. Well, and the other thing is if you, now that they've got this whole three song rule, you wouldn't have gotten some of the iconic images that you've shot at like. The uh, Ozzy Osbourne, Randy Rhodes tribute cover. Well, or... I could I could honestly say that I could only think of one picture on my website that was shot during the first three songs. Oh, really? It's a picture of Madonna that I took. Oh, okay. And she made this really cool pose right at the beginning of the sh- show when she walked out. Okay. But every other picture on my website was shot later on in the show. Because they're not warmed up yet. They're not, and you know. Well, if when a band when a band makes a set list. They're building to a climax. Exactly. The climax is when all the best things happen. Exactly. The last couple shows, the uh, last couple songs of the show, it's just, there's, right. there's the, the best. Course. Yeah. And this has become so pervasive at this point that, for example, this I keep on going back to this blues festival because this just happened. Mm-hmm. The rule at the venue is you can only shoot the first three songs of every band. It isn't even what the, what the band wants. And I can tell you this from experience. Don't ask me how this happened because this will take up the next two hours to try to explain. <laughs> okay. But about 1999 and 2000, I ended up being Brian Wilson's road manager. Oh, my God. <laughs> and we spent two years i spent two years with him traveling around the country wow. traveling around north america and japan oh. as his road manager and one of the things that the road manager does is um while the band is on stage doing sound check road manager goes and has a meeting with the head of security for the venue okay and you talk about like who's allowed backstage what kind of pass they need that night, what color the pass should be, okay. you know, all the basic rules. Right. And then at the end of every discussion, the guy who is usually, I mean, I'm five foot two. The guy is an ex-football player. 
Yeah. And is about a foot and a half taller than me. <laughs> right. And we're standing backstage and he and I'm he's towering over me and he says, Well, what's your uh what's your photo policy? Now, because it's me as the road manager, <laughs> I I made sure that Brian's wife knew all about this and Brian's manager knew about it. Everybody with a photo pass gets to shoot the whole show. Oh, that's and amazing. anybody in the audience with a camera gets to shoot the whole show. Well, they get to do that anyway. They get to do it anyway. The only thing that I requested is that nobody use a flash. Yeah, and that makes you sense. Know? So I would say that to this guy. And at least, I would say 70% of the time, the guy would look at me and say, sorry, we can't do that. That's and I would say, well, really sorry to tell you this, but this is my show ah. and you got to do it. Oh, good for you. And the guy would say, sorry, not going to do it. And I would say, but you have to do it. Oh. And he'd say, sorry, not going to do it. And we go round and round for like five minutes. And then I would say, go and get, get on the phone and call the theater manager Yeah, and have him come back here. And the theater manager would come back there. This happened almost every night. Theater manager would come back there, and he had much better things to do at that point. Oh, sure. Yeah. More than likely, the box office was just opening. The doors were about to open. He had to make sure all the ushers were in place. Yeah. He had to do all that stuff, but he had to deal with this crap that that really <laughs> is not relevant at all. Exactly. And he would come back, and every night... He, the same thing happened. The guy would look at him and point to me and say, this guy's telling me he wants all the photographers to shoot the whole show. And the guy would look at him and say, well, it's his show, so you got to do it. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> and I won every night if you could call it winning. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the point is every security guy in North America is just programmed to kick all the photographers out after three songs. Yeah. And that's the state of the business that I'm in right now, which is why I have no interest in going out there and being treated like dog crap by 20 year olds. Now, have you found any difference between in venue size in that policy? Because I, I found I've got a, a lot of leeway as far as shooting in smaller clubs. Like they don't want you in front of the stage for the first three, but I can wander around in the crowd and take some shots there. Well, it's hard to wander around when you're five foot two. Uh, well, I'm five foot six, so it's, well, I get I understand I, what I you're saying. It, I find it if I can't shoot from the front of the stage, I just go home. Okay, but it, it's also the angle because what I try to do is I try to I try to shoot up at the artist mm -hmm. so that I get the backlights in the shot. Yeah. So by doing that, you get light hitting the back of their shoulders and the back of their head. And it, and it separates from the background. Yeah, you get that aura effect. And it basically makes them look three-dimensional rather than two-dimensional. That's a good point. Okay. When you shoot from the soundboard, you're shooting straight on. Yeah. And everybody looks shorter and two-dimensional. That's now, very Now, why true. anybody would want that is, a, is beyond me, but <laughs> that's what everybody's asking for these days. That's uh, That happened to me one time, fortunately only once so, so far. I will, I will put a caveat so far with Brandy Carlisle, but... That's the only venue that, because that's the largest venue that I shot, probably possibly one of the larger artists that I've shot. So it's, uh, I guess that kind of makes sense at this point. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that's, uh, Brandy used to be a really wonderful person that let anybody shoot anything they wanted, you know, but, yeah. but as soon as they get big, somebody, they see everybody else doing it. Yeah. And they got to do it too. And they become very image conscious. But, well, it's, you know, it's, it's not, they don't even know why they're doing it. I can't tell you how many bands I've talked to about it that when I said, you know, I really need to shoot the whole show. They say the, the response from the band is, and this is an exact quote from many conversations. Why do we kick people out after three songs? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. They don't know. Nobody. That, I, there was a band. Did you ever hear of a band called Jesus Lizard? Oh Yeah. David so Yao. They're from Chicago. Yeah. And they're great. They're, they're friends of mine. And this was maybe 20 years ago. They came over to my house to do a photo shoot. And at the end of the shoot, they were all, we're all sitting around drinking beers and talking. And the singer turned to me and he said, 
you're a photographer. You know the answer to this question. Why is it that as soon as our show gets really good, all the photographers leave? Oh. And I said, well, you know, maybe you should have your road manager tell the venue guys to let everybody stay for the whole show. So yeah. about a month later, they went out on Lollapalooza. used to be a traveling show. Yeah, I went to have a bunch of those. So they were the opening act on that show. Okay. They went on like in broad daylight when nobody was there. <laughs> right. Very few people were there. Yeah. Uh, and I went out to the show and got my photo pass and there was a note in it saying, you can only shoot the first three songs of every band except for Jesus Lizard, who's requested that everybody be allowed to shoot the whole show. Oh, that's awesome. So I shot them and... I shot the I shot three songs of all the other bands and you know yeah didn't like the idea but I did it because at that point I was still doing it yeah and when I got home the next morning I got up and I called my friend a friend of mine that lives in New York that shoots for this you might have heard of this little publication it's called the New York Times I think I have it sounds and, f- so familiar and I said I said are you going out to Lollapalooza to shoot and she said yeah I just got an assignment from the Times. And I said, well, make sure you get there early enough to shoot the first band. And she did, even though it meant, you know, you got to go out to Long Island. They were playing at Jones Beach. So oh, okay, yeah. Like, way you had to rent a car yes. and go out there. The <laughs> yeah. hardest part of renting a car to go to Jones Beach is you have to figure out where to put the car when you get home at midnight. Yes. Because you can't return it until the next morning. Right. Oh, uh, man. So you got to go through all that. And so she went out there. She shot Jesus Lizard, and at the end of the show, David, the singer, dove off the stage into the crowd. And the crowd picked him up and held him over their heads on his back. And he was laying on his back with hands holding him up singing. And she took pictures of it. She was sitting right, standing right there. And that picture of them made not the front page of the art section in the New York Times, the front page of the freaking New York Times. Oh, man. Now, how could Jesus Lizard get on the front page of the New York Times without killing somebody? Right. <laughs> you know, yes. they, because they happened to have that conversation with me in my living room while they were drinking beers. That's a- And realized they could get people, allow people to shoot the whole show. I wish more bands knew that. Oh, man. Well... It almost never happens. No. I feel that one every time I go out. I'm going to feel that one tomorrow when I go out to uh, shoot failure. But- right, right. <laughs> but if you if you were to go back and talk to them and explain it logically, yeah. My guess is you probably had a you probably have a 50/50 chance of them saying, "Oh yeah, that makes sense. You should shoot the whole show." Just try it as an experiment. Yeah, that's definitely worth it. I mean, what can, the worst thing to say is no, you just you get three songs. Right, exactly, exactly. So, see, but explain it in a logical way. Yeah. Another, another good, another good thing to say to them is, look at the drummer and say, "Hey, if I only shoot three songs, guaranteed, I'm not taking any pictures of you whatsoever." Right. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's Phil Collins. That, uh, that's true. And you can say that to the bass player too, unless he's the singer. The only, yes. if you only have three songs, you're just going to shoot the singer and the guitar player. Yeah. The other thing you could say to them is that probably during the first three songs, they're not going to be close enough to each other to get a shot of both of them together. Yeah, especially the bigger the band. They're probably going to be. Yeah. Yeah, especially when it's a big big name band. Yeah. All right, so do you still shoot a lot of film or have you switched to digital or do a little bit of both? I haven't shot film in 10 years. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, that makes you feel uh, good. I I, uh, I only shoot digital. Okay, good. That, be, that makes me feel better for just shooting digital myself now, too. Oh, no. When it, when it first came out, I bought the first Nikon digital camera. Oh, wow. It was called a D1. Yes. And the quality of the scans or, or images 
was just terrible. <laughs> but, you know, you had to switch because everybody wanted something right away. Yep. And they slowly started making, then I got a, the D100, then I got a D200, then a D300. Now I got a, I got a D750 and a D800. Oh, okay. And the quality that I get out of those cameras is better than anything you could ever get on film. Oh, it's isn't it amazing? Yeah, and it doesn't cost anything. So you're an Nikon guy then? Have you always you always been an yeah, Nikon? Yeah, I've always guy? been. I've oh, okay. always been Nikon. I've always so been Canon. You, once you buy a bunch of lenses, you can't switch. That's true. That is true. I don't think it makes any difference what kind of camera you use, you know, as long as you know how to use it right. Yeah, exactly. And, but, you know, like you're trapped once you once you own four lenses. Yeah. <laughs> you're trapped. That's exactly true. <laughs> and if you have a 300 on the shelf, 300 millimeter lens on the shelf, oh. for sure you're tra- trapped because to replace that with another lens is going to be like 6,000 bucks. Yep. Yep. I, uh, I can't afford that yet, but, you know, maybe one of these if I ever get any money for my photos, because right now it's like right. nothing. Less right. than nothing. I'm paying to do this, basically. Kind of like this podcast. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what kind of editing do you do? Do you do much more than just, you know, tweaking exposures and everything? Or do you do you play around a lot in post? Um, very little. Okay. I, I try not. I try to get the right exposure going. Yeah. Not, a, not always. Doesn't always work. But I, know that I shoot everything in raw, so you get a lot of leeway. Okay, yeah. And the only thing I, I fix is the exposure. Okay, you tighten up the levels a little bit. Yeah, tighten up the levels. Exposure and contrast with levels. Yeah. Uh, I don't take microphones out of the shot. I, I, don't, I don't fix. Occasionally, I'll fix wrinkles in somebody if they're. Yeah. <laughs> if it's a woman and I know she'd be mad. Yeah. I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll do a little bit of work, fix it up a little bit. Yeah. But not a lot. So I was trying to figure this this out. I was looking at, uh, it looks like 1984 was a huge year for you. And I know I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit here, but I I was just started thinking, and I've I've got your website up, which is one reason why I asked. That's the year you started working with Prince, and everything just seemed to like snowball for you. Well, it it actually wasn't. 1984. It was June of 1984. Oh, okay. It's very specific. July, <laughs> uh, two months that changed my life. Wow. Okay. Um, and it was all totally by accident. Oh, what happened? All right. You got to tell me what happened or how well, it happened. I had, I had shot, I had shot Prince a lot before that. Okay. Since his first album came out. Oh, okay. And I never met him still, you know, throughout his entire career, never met him. Oh, wow. Uh, really? Never had any real interest in meeting them. I don't. I'm. I don't get off on meeting people. I rather just shoot pictures of them and go home. Okay. If I'm doing a photo shoot with them, I have to meet them. But yeah. you know, so I'm guessing that they probably like my work. Okay. You know, his management, maybe him. I don't know. Yeah. I have no clue whatsoever. <laughs> and one day I got a call from beginning of June of '84. I got a call from a publicist from Warner Brothers who said, Prince is having a birthday party up in Minneapolis at the club that Purple Rain was shot in. Oh, cool. Club called First Avenue. Okay. And um, we want to know if you want to go up there and shoot it. Oh, wow. And, you know, I had to pay my own way. I was still shooting film at that time, so I got to pay for all the film, all the processing. Yeah. But I figured... And she said, he's going to perform for an hour. Oh, cool. At this party. Okay. And I figured, okay, I'm not going to go and follow him around the room and take pictures of him with guests. I'm just going to go up there for the performance. Okay. So I figured I'd be one of like a hundred photographers pushing and shoving in front of the stage to get the right position. Yeah. Like, no, I get up there like early evening, flew up there, got in a cab, went to the club. There's a guy at the front door. He's got the guest list. It's a private party, not okay. open to the public. Oh, okay. And he's got the guest list. And I said, well, I'm on the photographer's list. And I gave him my name. And he looks through like 20 pages of a guest list. Oh, man. And he comes to the last page. And it says, photographer singular. Wow. And there's one name under it. Oh, man. And 
I still to this day have no idea why that happened. <laughs> That's amazing. So he says, go on in, do whatever you want. And I went in. Wow. And I just walked up to the stage and put my camera bag on the front of the stage. <laughs> and I brought a book with me. And I just <laughs> sat down on the floor in the front of the stage and read a book until he came on stage. Oh, man. And he was about three feet away from me. And the stage was at waist level for me. So. Oh, nice. You know, it was like, <laughs> like, you know, right, like no further away than I am to this phone that I'm talking to you on. And uh, I shot for an hour. I shot like 30 rolls of film, of oh. color slide film, transparency film. Oh, wow. Which at that point was like 20 bucks a roll for film and processing. Yeah. I remember those. So days. I spent a lot of money. And I figured hopefully I can make that money back. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I got home, I developed all the film the next day, and I started sending it out to magazines. And um, one of the magazines I sent it to was Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. And they said, okay, we're going to use three shots. Uh, we're going to do a full page of pictures from this party. Oh, wow. So, okay, I figure I'm going to make back some of the money right there. Right. And then the photo editor said, hey, there's somebody here that wants to talk to you. And it was a woman that I knew that was a publicist. And she was, she just happened to be up at Rolling Stone and she saw my Prince pictures. And her biggest client was and still is this guy you might have heard of by the name of Bruce Springsteen. Yes, I'm familiar with him. So she said, hey, you know, I love these pictures. You took a Prince. Can you come up to Minneapolis next week and shoot the opening of Bruce's Born in the USA tour? Wow. So... Okay, no problem. <laughs> so another $100 round trip plane ticket and a hotel room for a couple, three or four days. And she said, come up a day early because Bruce is going to be shooting a video, the first video he ever shot for the song Dancing in the Dark. Yes, I remember it well. Uh, with Courtney Cox. Yeah. And uh, you'll have total access to that. And then you can shoot the first three shows of the tour. Wow. Oh, man. They're all in, it's all in St. Paul, Minnesota, at the St. Paul Civic Center. So I went up there, shot all of that stuff. I came home, developed all that film, sent a bunch of stuff to Rolling Stone. They said, we're going to do a full page of pictures of that. And the same issue as the Prince stuff. And Jeez, oh, um, you own that issue. Then all the rock magazines started buying pictures and putting, them on the, putting Springsteen on the cover or Prince on the cover. And... I made back my money times 50. Oh, that is awesome. Oh, because after Prince played that show, he went into seclusion for the whole summer. Oh, really? and the record came out and went to number one. The movie came out and went to number one. And I was the only person in the world that had pictures of him dressed like he was in the movie. Oh my gosh. From Jeez. June 7th until November when he started his North American tour. But the, uh, the other part of the other component to this whole thing is after I sent Rolling Stone the pictures of, of Springsteen, they called me up the next day and said, we want to fly you down to Kansas City to shoot the opening two dates of the Jackson's Victory Tour. Oh, my God. <laughs> so this is all in a one-month period of time. Wow. And that was, you know... That was the month that made me. That's amazing. So the, the residual effect from that was a year late. Oh, and then the other part of it, when I got back from Springsteen, I shot three full shows and the video shoot, but I still didn't have enough. And like a couple days later, he was playing up in Wisconsin. So I called the publicist and said, hey, I want to shoot those shows too. And, you know, so yeah, sure, no problem. You know, we'll leave a pass for you. Oh, nice. So I went up and shot two more shows. And a year later, in August of 1985, he graduated from playing hockey arenas to playing football stadiums. And Newsweek decided to do an article about, you know, Bruce Springsteen becomes the biggest artist in the pla on the planet, you know. Yeah. And, uh, they called his publicist and said, we need pictures for the article. And she said, you should call this guy in Chicago. He's got some really great pictures. Oh, nice. So they called me and, and they said, it's going to be a big article. So send a lot of pictures. And I sent them, you know, like 10 pages of slides. Oh, nice. 
20 to a page. Wow. And a week later, one of my pictures was on the cover of Newsweek. Oh, man. So that that's not nice. even the end of the story. Oh, wow. Okay. So this is now a year later. This is August of 85. Okay. So um, the magazine comes out. My picture of Bruce is on the cover. I get a call from the Chicago Sun-Times, and they want to do an article about me because Chicago photographer gets the cover of Newsweek. Okay. So they came out and interviewed me, and they took my picture holding up the magazine. And uh, didn't think anything of it. Like, okay, great, no problem. And the next day I get a call from this talk show, local talk show. It was uh, 9 o'clock in the morning on the ABC station in Chicago. It's called AM Chicago. And they said, Bruce is coming to town this Friday. And we want to do a, we're doing a show on people that have had some kind of contact with him. Oh. You know, like, and having a picture on the cover of Newsweek is considered having contact with them. Okay. So I, didn't, I, I don't watch TV in the morning. So I had no idea that the host of the show was this woman by the name of Oprah Winfrey. Oh, wow. Who wasn't even there. She was in. Hollywood shooting the color purple at the time. Oh man. But it was her talk show. Okay. So I go to the show. I'm on live TV for an hour sitting on stage with four other people that one of them was a woman that had washed Bruce's dishes <laughs> the last time he was in town. <laughs> uh, and I sat there for an hour and never said a word. Oh my gosh. And at the end of the hour, they said cut, and I got up, I took the microphone off, put it on my chair, and I started walking out, and this woman walks up to me and says, hey, give me a card, because our show is going to go national in a couple of months, and we might need a photographer, and we know you wouldn't be interested, but uh, <laughs> maybe you know somebody. Oh, jeez. So I gave her a card, she gave me a card, I put it in my pocket, I didn't even look at it. Right. And... She calls me a week later. She says, can you come down for a meeting? We want to talk to you. And I go down. I picked out the card. Her name was Debbie. She, she was actually she's actually from Baltimore. Oh, okay. And she actually lives there again now. Oh, man. And she was the executive producer of the Oprah Winfrey Show. Wow. And she said, we want to talk to you about being the photographer for the show. And I, I know that when you work for a TV production – they make you sign a work for hire agreement and they own everything. Yeah. And, but I also knew that there would be celebrities that would be on her show. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause that's how you get ratings, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. You have Arnold Schwarzenegger or, St or Stallone or Elizabeth Taylor, all people that were on her show in the first two years, nice. uh, Jimmy Carter, Barbara Walters, Jeez. you know, you name it. So I figured, I'm not going to do this unless I could own all these pictures. So I made a deal with them that I'll shoot the shows. You can use them to publicize the show, but I own the copyright to everything. Nice. And for five years, I was her personal photographer. Th oh, man. And, wow. you know, we flew all over the country and shot stuff. And, you know, it was, uh, and it was always in the morning, so it didn't affect, what else I was, you know, yeah. I was shooting concerts at night, but in the morning I wasn't doing anything. So yeah. <laughs> why not go down there and make a few bucks? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that was the, that was the ancillary part of that month of June and July of 1984. That, oh my gosh, what a story. Jeez. That so th th then there's one more part that goes a couple of years further on. Okay. Uh, that was an equally interesting part of the story. Totally different part. My next door neighbor was the music critic of the Sun Times in Chicago. Oh, wow. And he called me up one day and he said, Hey, listen, I just got an assignment to go to New York to interview Keith Richards. Oh. Uh, he had a solo album coming out. Oh, okay. It was called Talk is Cheap. Right. This was 1988. So this was uh, three years after the Newsweek cover. Okay. And uh, the Sun-Times was too cheap to send a photographer. So <laughs> he said, if you pay your own way to New York, I'll put you in as the Sun-Times photographer. Nice. And you can sell us pictures and then own the pictures to sell to other places. So, awesome. you know, it's Keith Richards. How do you say no to that? Exactly. 
So I uh, got on a plane a couple days later, flew to New York, slept on the floor of his hotel room the night before. <laughs> and the next day, we walked over to Keith's manager's office and we walked in the door and there's Keith Richards sitting there. Jeez. And I did a photo shoot with him. He was a great guy. Yeah. He was the nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. That's so good. Uh, and then while I was packing up my equipment, my friend Don was interviewing him and Don asked him, so you have the solo album that just came out. Are you going to tour? Not with the Stones, but with your own band. Right, yeah. And he said, yeah, we're doing a tour from Thanksgiving to Christmas. was in September. So I just filed that away in my brain. And um, I got home, I developed the film. I shot two and a quarter Hasselblad portraits. Ooh, nice. Uh, incredibly sharp, crisp portraits. Yeah. And I made a bunch of prints for the Sun-Times and I made an extra set because I have my own dark room and cost you an extra 20 cents to make another print. Exactly. So I made another set of prints. I put them in an envelope and I wrote a two line note to Keith's manager. Hey, I heard you're going out on the road soon. If you need a photographer, give me a call. Sign my name to it. <laughs> Have my number at the top of the page. Okay. And I, I just put a piece of cardboard in an envelope, put the prints in, sealed it up, put some stamps on it, threw it in the mailbox. Right. <laughs> and didn't even go to the post office to drop it off. <laughs> Just threw it in the mailbox, you know. For all I know, it could still be there, except I know it isn't there because the day before Thanksgiving, she called me up and said, so what are you doing tomorrow? And I said, well, you know, I was going to go to my parents' house for Thanksgiving. And she said, nope, you're our tour photographer. Wow. Uh, pack your stuff, get on a plane and fly to Atlanta and meet us there. Oh, man. So I met her there and I rode on a bus with Keith for about three weeks until Christmas oh and uh, shot the shows, hung out with them, sat on a bus with them after the shows, like him playing guitar and writing songs with the band. And, you oh, know, wow, I, I thought this is the coolest thing that could ever happen to me. Yeah. This is cooler than having the cover of Newsweek or anything like that. <laughs> so I was gone for a month. I came home and there was this huge pile of mail right. in, in my front entranceway. Oh, I bet, yeah. So I shovel it all off to the side and I see the first issue of 1989 of Rolling Stone. So I figured, okay, I'm going to read that first. So mm -hmm. I lay on the couch, open it up, and I go to random notes and there's a little paragraph that says, the Rolling Stones are going to make a new album this year, and they've decided to go out on tour starting in September. And they had, at that point, they kind of, Mick and Keith kind of hated each other. Yeah. But uh, they made up, and they, you know, they did it for the money, and, oh, yeah. you know, let's <laughs> go out on tour. So I wrote the exact same note to her. <laughs> hey, I heard you guys are going on tour. If you need a photographer, give me a call. <laughs> Put a stamp on the envelope, dropped it in the mail. Never uh -huh. heard a thing from her. Uh, then my same friend, Don McLeese from mm -hmm. the Sun Times, yeah. gave me a call and he said, hey, it was when they were rehearsing for the tour. Okay. He says, hey, I'm going to Philadelphia tomorrow to interview all five members of the Rolling Stones Ooh. separately. And I'm going to see two rehearsals. And Man. once again, the sometimes doesn't want to send a photographer. So if you want to go, buy a plane ticket. Same deal. So I bought a plane ticket. I went there. I They played in Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, which I think is torn down now. Might uh, be, yeah. It was falling apart when we were there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, they, be, they were basically playing for their crew and for me. Wow. And I just got, I wandered around on stage and shot pictures. I, anywhere I wanted to go. That's amazing. So I came home and figured, okay, maybe they're going to call me. Maybe I'm going to be a tour photographer for Rolling Stones. And the tour started, and 
I'm re- seeing it on the news and I'm seeing magazine articles and no phone calls. Mm. And about a month into it, Keith's manager calls me and says, so what are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, well, if this is anything like last time, I guess I'm coming to see you. Where am I going? <laughs> and she said, get up in the morning and fly to Boston, come to the Ritz Carlton and call me when you get here. Wow. And the next day I flew to Boston, uh, gave somebody my luggage, somebody I had no idea who they were. <laughs> she told, she said, go up to room 2307, drop off your luggage. Uh, he'll give you a pass. Meet us in the lobby at two o'clock. Oh. And at two o'clock, I got in a van with the Rolling Stones and we went out to Foxborough where the Patriots play. Right. And I shot or played. Yeah. And I shot my first Rolling Stones concert from right on stage. Oh. And then after the show, we all got in a series of vans and we, with a police escort, drove out to Logan International, got on a private jet and flew to Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, my gosh. So on, in one day, I went from Chicago to Boston to Birmingham, Alabama. Oh, my God. Riding on a private jet with the Rolling Stones. And I was supposed to do a month on tour. And about three weeks into it, I get a call one morning in my room. We stayed in Ritz-Carlton or Four Seasons everywhere we went, oh. which was great. So I get a call. on This is before cell phones. So I get a call on the phone in my room, mm-hmm. pick it up, and Keith's manager says, hey, can you come up to my room? And I'm thinking, it's like being called to the principal's office. Yeah, what did like, I do? Did I do something wrong? <laughs> And I go up to her room, and she's sitting there with mix manager and the publicist for the tour. And I'm thinking, this is being called into three principal's yes. offices. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I must have done something really bad. Right. And they said, sit down. And I sat down, and they said, you know what? We have a problem. You're supposed to leave at the end of the week and be done with us, but the band really likes you, and we, we really like your work. Wow. And we want you to stay and do the whole tour. Oh, which was another two and a half months. That's a dream. You're, you're and, a huge Stones you know, fan, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. How am I going to say no to that? Yeah. So, you know, I ended up doing three and a half months on the road with the Stones in 89. God. And, uh, they called me in 94 and I did a month in 94. In 97, they started the tour in Chicago. So I shot all the rehearsals, oh. and then I shot the first two dates, and I jumped on a plane with them, went to Nashville, and shot them in Nashville the next day. And then I came home, and that was the end of it. But they still call me every time they come to town. That is amazing. And I go oh. and shoot just for the hell of it. That's incredible. So, oh. yeah, that's those two stories, they're kind of separated by a couple of years, but that's kind of the summation of – the best of my life. That is amazing. See, that's the kind of thing I, I, I would die for, for an opportunity like that. Well, or if presented know, with that. So would every other person that owns a camera yeah, in America. I think so. You know, and, and I just kind of, <laughs> I mean, I, I know I got it because I was good, but yeah. I, but I kind of just stumbled into it. Right place, if right time, have, talent. If I wouldn't have flown to New York with Don, when he interviewed Keith, I never would have heard that he was going out on the road, and I never would have sent that two lines to his manager, <laughs> which started the whole ball rolling down the hill. Was that the, the session where you took the picture of him giving you the bird? Yeah. Oh, okay. Except I didn't know. I didn't know we had done that. <laughs> and I got home, I developed the film, and I made contact prints. Okay, yeah. And, uh, and I didn't see it. Oh, because it was like the fourth roll in a strip Mm -hmm. and it was at the bottom of the page and the the finger was all the way at the bottom. And it's a little bit subtle. I I picked like two or three other shots to print to give to the Sun-Times. Never saw the finger. (laughs) And I just put the proof sheets in the in the file cabinet under Keith Richards. Okay. And about a year later, people tend to come over to my house and say, hey, can I look through your stuff? (laughs) And I say, go ahead. Just don't put it don't keep it in order right because if it it gets out of order i'll never find anything (laughs) and they you know they always gravitate toward the stones or 
Prince or Springsteen. Yeah. And they gravitated to Keith Richards, and this guy pulled out the file. He's looking, and he says, and I had circled the ones that I had printed. And he looks, and he, all of a sudden he calls to me across the room. He says, why didn't you ever print the one with him giving you the finger? And I looked at him with, like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and he brought it over to me, and I saw it, and I'm like, oh, my God, I better print that. Yeah. Oh. And and otherwise, if that guy wouldn't have said that, I probably still wouldn't know that he gave me the finger. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Jeez. But he didn't, get, you know, he's, he's a, the nicest guy in the world. He didn't do it for any reason other than the fact you can see the smile on his face. Oh, yeah, he's just clowning around. Everything he does has got a smile on his face. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that kind of brings us to the the book. Yeah, I figured you'd have to talk about that at some point. At some point. I, I was going to get around to it eventually. So you're releasing a book, The Moment of Truth. Now, does that is that uh, have any relation to Cartier-Bresson for the, the decisive moment? Yeah, I, I actually wanted to call it the decisive moment, but I was, I was vetoed on that one. Oh. <laughs> uh, but I, there is a whole article... There's a whole half a page that I wrote inside about the decisive moment. Excellent. And about Cartier Brisson. Oh, that is excellent. I I love it. And it's it's along with a bunch of pictures of guys jumping off of things. Oh yeah. During shows. (laughs) That's because I have a theory that if a guy is on stage and he climbs up on something, (laughs) there's only two ways for him to get down. (laughs) And one of them's going to look really lame, and one of them's going to look really cool. That's true. <laughs> so there, it's very doubtful that he's going to, like, get down on his hands and knees and back his way down. He's going to jump. <laughs> and if, you, if, you're, if you're ready, you're going to capture that. And yeah. I, it's pretty evident when they're going to jump. And the key to it is to have a wide-angle lens on it so you get the stage in the picture. Mm-hmm. So you can see how far he is up in the air. And I have a whole series in the book of Pete Townsend jumping through the air, Eddie Van Halen jumping through the air, yeah. the band Warrant, that hair metal band. Oh, yeah. Where I got like four guys in the air. Oh, nice. All at the same time. <laughs> oh, man. And, and uh, the one that I like the most is a band you've probably never heard of. They're called Atlas Genius. I, yeah, I don't think I've heard of them. They're a three-piece Australian kind of punk pop band. Okay. And this was like 20, right, the year before the pandemic. Okay. 2018, so 20, maybe. 2019, yeah. And they were playing in town at the House of Blues. And they, one of my clients was, at the time, was Sure Microphones. Oh, yeah, yeah. And part of, the, they're based in Chicago. Part of the deal is... Uh, if they sign somebody to an endorsement deal, they have to let me shoot the whole show. Oh, nice. Because I have to be able to get the microphones from oh. the right angle with the right light behind them. And, you know, yeah, gotta yeah. get the guy looking good singing. Okay. So all the other photographers left after three songs. I'm in the pit for the whole show. Wow. And at the end of the show, the singer who's also the guitar player. He's got his guitar around his neck. He climbs up on the bass drum and he turns around and faces the audience. And you, you know, he's going to jump. Yep. I mean, you know, what are the odds that he's going to, you know, do anything but jump? Exactly. So I got ready and he jumped and I got what I consider to be the perfect rock and roll shot. Oh, man. He's about eight feet in the air. The drummer has got both of his hands up in the air and he's getting ready to hit the drums with both sticks. And the bass player is standing with his foot up on the drum riser. They're all in the shot. They're all looking good. The lighting is perfect. You can see the stage and he's got his guitar and he's flying through the air. Oh, man. And I knew as soon as I took the picture that I had it. So I went home and I developed the film. Or not developed the film, but downloaded the, the images and I went right to the last image I had shot. <laughs> yeah. That was the one. And I got it, and I quickly converted the RAW into a JPEG, and I sent it to the guys at Sure with a note. That night, I sent them, so they would get it in the morning when they got there to their mm-hmm. office. Yeah. This is why you got to let people, you got to make sure that I could always shoot the whole show. Yeah. So about six months later, the band comes back to town, play at the same venue. 
So I made him a print. I made him a nice 11 by 14 inkjet print. Oh, nice. Because you could, you know, you can make a print for next to nothing these days. Yeah. That's one another great advantage about digital is, you know, I've got a big inkjet print. I can make up to 16 by 20 oh, wow. color or black and white prints oh. that look better than a print from a photo lab. Wow. And a 16 by 20 cost me like $5. Jeez. And 11 by, 11 by 14 costs maybe a dollar. Maybe even less. Oh, my gosh. So I made the print, put it in an envelope. I went down there. I went backstage before the show, and I gave it to the singer. And he pulls it out of the envelope, and he looks at it, and he says, how'd you get that? And I said, well, first thing I got to tell you, when I took that picture, all the other photographers were already at home because you kicked everybody out after three songs. Yep. And he was one of the people that said to me, why do you do, why do we do that? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, well, your road manager is right in the next room. All you got to do is go in and tell them to go and tell the head of security to, of the venue to let everybody shoot the whole show. So he walked out there and I followed him because I wanted to see what would happen. And he said to the road manager, like, hey, can you go down and tell the venue that I want all the photographers to shoot the whole show? And the road manager who works for him, this is the operative word. Right. He doesn't work for the road manager. Right. The road manager works for him. Yeah. Looked at him and he said, sorry, I can't do it. And he looked at him and he said, well, why not? And he said, because it's too hard to do, because every security guy is conditioned to kick you out after three songs. Uh, now, I know it's not hard to do. No. All you got to do is go up to one guy, whoever's the head of security, and you say, Tell all your guys in the pit to let everybody shoot the whole show and walk away. That's all you got to do. But he refused to do it uh, because he, then he'd have to police the situation and make sure that it actually happened. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it'll, it'll never change because there are too many people like that in the world. Unfortunately, I think you're right. And it's a shame because you, we're missing the best parts of the show. They're, they're missing well, the best images. Well, the shot of the guy flying through the air. You're never going to get that in the first three songs. Never. No, 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 Nobody's never. ever going to do something like that at the beginning of a show. No, never. Like you said at the beginning, they're building to a climax. You don't do that at the right. beginning. And every shot I got of somebody jumping through the air was because I shot the whole show. And it was all toward the end of the show. What made you uh, decide to put a book out? Was it your idea or was it somebody else's idea? Uh, nothing's ever my idea. <laughs> uh, just kidding. I, uh, I have a friend who's a, uh, she works for the city of Chicago in the tourism department. Or she did. She doesn't anymore. Uh, and she has, had been bugging me for like 10 years. Like, you got to do a book. You got to do a book. You got to do a book. And I really wasn't that interested, but she called me up one day and she said, Hey, I got this friend from college that has this publishing company. And I talked to him and he wants to meet you and he wants to do a book of your work. So I, she gave me the address of the office and she said, I'll meet you there in an hour. And you know, an hour later I showed up at the office. She showed up, we went upstairs, we met Sam who owns Trope and uh, talked for an hour. And he said, okay, let's do a book. Oh, wow. Jeez. And then it took, it's taken like three years because so, of the pandemic. I was going to ask, was, is this something that you, do, you took on because of the pandemic or did you start it before? No, this is before the, this is a year before the pandemic. Wow, okay. And it was supposed to come out the Christmas of the first year of the pandemic. So that's 2019. And uh, we started out by him coming over and we went through my files. We started with ABBA. <laughs> And we worked our way all the way to ZZ Top. Wow. And it took like four two-hour sessions. Yeah, because you shot like 4,500 different artists or something. It's like, like it's a little over 4,500 names at this point. Wow. And that's just, all, a, that's just names. That's not even, that's not shows. That's just different. No, no, no. Some of them I've only shot once. Some of them I've shot 30 or 40 times. The wow. Stones I've shot 100 times. Yeah. But a guy I've shot like 200 times. Jeez. But it could be, for example, I don't know if you're a jazz fan, but uh, there's a band called Weather Report. Yeah, oh yeah. And when they broke up, I divided up all the Weather Report photos into separate folders for each one of the guys in the band. Oh. Because they all are stars in their own right. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's Weather Report. There is a Weather Report file, but there's also a, a 
Jaco Pistorius file. Yeah. There's a Joe Zawinul file. There's a Peter Erskine file. Uh, and they're, they, they all, because I get a lot of calls from magazines, like we're looking for pictures of Peter Erskine. If I don't remember immediately that he was in Weather Report, I just look and it's all alphabetical and I could grab it. That's smart. So if it's <laughs> if it, it's all scanned now, during the pandemic, I scanned my whole archive. Oh, wow. All the film. So I put the Peter Erskine photos in the Weather Report file and in the Peter Erskine file. It makes sense. Because it's the identical thing. Right. But they, I still get calls from people and they want pictures of a band that I don't remember. I've never heard of them and don't remember ever shooting them. <laughs> and then I look through my files and find out not only did I shoot them, but I did two photo shoots with them. <laughs> and I still to this day have no idea who they are. Oh, my gosh. So is the book the well-known work or is it outtakes or a little bit of both? It's, it's all, it's all my best stuff. Oh, excellent. Um, you know, I, I don't want to put anything in that's an out. I don't believe in outtakes. Okay. I don't save anything unless it's a good photograph, but some are better than others. Right. And I want the best of each artist in there. Oh, beautiful. So there's 150 photos in this book and they're, they're, there's only like I think there's only two photos that repeat the artist. Oh wow! Every other one is an individual is a picture of an artist that doesn't appear anywhere else in the book. Oh, that- except that there's a little section on the Stones. There's a little section on Springsteen. Okay. A little section on Prince because those are the ones that I've shot the most of. Right over my time but there's only one michael jackson wow there's two tom petty shots because there's one really great photo that i had to put in the book that's actually the back cover but there's also this i took this amazing shot of tom petty and bob dylan on stage together oh okay then there's also a picture of bob dylan on his own from another show so you know but that's the only time it actually repeats itself i I think that's acceptable yeah, yeah, I'm I'm going with it. I'm going with it. Is it up for pre-order still, or is it? It's on Amazon for pre-order. You just go, just put my name into the search box on Amazon, and it comes up. Okay. I think there's a the release date is like the end of July. Okay. okay. Uh, but nobody knows because it's on the book is printed. I've actually seen a real copy of it. Okay. So I know I know that they're done printing. You know what it but gets it's on exists. a ship somewhere, somewhere between China and Los Angeles. Oh, still. And you know who knows oh. what's going to happen when it gets to the port of Los Angeles. Oh my gosh! You know there could be there could be two hundred boats out there waiting to unload. Yeah, really. And oh. five hundred containers waiting on, at, in the port. Yeah, exactly. On land. So, so you know. I, it'll, when it comes out, I'll be pleasantly surprised, but you know, I, who knows? I, I'm hoping they're right. And it, I'm getting a little sick of waiting, but yeah. you know, so it's on a slow boat from China. It's on a slow boat from China. So, yeah. <laughs> so, and Amazon exactly. would be the best way to, to find it then right now. It's either Amazon or the trope website. It's trope.com T R O P E. And do you have any type of uh, social media accounts that, that uh, people can follow or is I it... don't, I don't believe in social media myself, <laughs> Nice. but trope has trope has all, you know, they have Facebook and Twitter and they have everything. And you've got your website, right? I've got my website, which is, you know, I've got, I'm building a new website that's going up next week oh, okay. and it'll have a page for the book, but you know, my website is napkin.net mm-hmm. and that has got there, some of the pictures from the book are on the website. Okay. But there's a lot of bo- pictures in the book that are not on the website. Well, oh, that's, that's good though. I make sure. Yeah. The, the website is kind of a portfolio. Like if sense. a, if a publicist wants to show a band, my work, it used to be that you'd have to send like a physical portfolio. Yeah. Now I just send a link and yep. say, here you go. Look at the link. It's amazing. It really yeah, is. Yeah. And some people look at it. Some people don't. Yeah, exactly. I remember the first time I looked at the, uh, I worked with the Dixie chicks mm-hmm. back in the nineties when they would just come out. Uh, I had sent their manager a link to my website and I got on their tour bus to go to the gig and they had looked at every page of my website. Oh, wow. And they were asking me pictures about, pictures on like the 35th page uh, and you know and i 
I've always liked them for that reason. That I mean, is awesome. Other than the fact that they're really nice people. Yeah. But they did their research. So. Yeah. They, you know, they actually cared about what was going to happen with them. Yeah, exactly. Well, Paul, I, I really do appreciate it. And I've spent a lot of time talking to you and, and hearing some amazing stories. Thank you so much for spending all this time with me and, and uh, talking to photos. It's, that's, it's my dream. I, I love talking photography with people. So I, No problem. Anytime you want to do it again, let me know. 